Welcome. We are live at the Crawford Family Forum at the Moen Broadcast Center at KPCC. Thank you all for joining us. We are, yes, please, clap yourselves up. I am sitting here with Michael Govan. Michael Govan joined the LA County Museum of Art in 2006. And as LACMA's director and chief executive officer, he oversees all of the activities of the museum, including art programming and the planned overhaul of the museum's 20-acre campus, which we will certainly talk about. From 1994 to 2006, Govan was president and director of the DIA Art Foundation, based in New York City. And prior to that, he served for six years as deputy director of the Guggenheim Museum. LACMA is the largest encyclopedic museum in the Western United States with a collection that includes more than 120,000 works spanning the entire history of art from ancient times to the present. Last year, it had 1.23 million visitors. The museum is currently celebrating its 50th anniversary, so we thought this would be a great opportunity to celebrate that anniversary and talk with Michael Govan about LACMA's past, present, and future. And we are honored that he is our guest in the Frame's very first public event. Michael, welcome to the Frame. Uh, thanks, John. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here. I suspect many of our guests have visited LACMA, but some people may not know that how LACMA came to be. Perhaps you can give us a little history of the museum's roots as part of the LA County Natural History, history Museum and how it came to be that an art museum would be created there. Well, it, early on, say 1915, it was the Los Angeles Museum of Science, History, and Art. It was in Exposition Park, where you know the current Museum of Natural History. Um, and it was in 1916, I think, that the first work, Cliff Dwellers, that it hangs in the museum today, was acquired. Um, Major works were acquired during those early days. You may know Diego Rivera's um, A Flower Day, which was acquired in 1925, pretty much when it was contemporary art um, <laughs> at that time. Uh, Hearst gave works, Getty gave works at that time, but it was a very small collection. As it grew, the, the trustees decided it was time for a, a real museum, its own home, uh, identified the space in Hancock Park on Wilshire Boulevard, and it was in 1960 that decision was made. We were born there as an art museum, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in 1965. Um, and the rest is history. There was a, it was a great moment of pride in 1965 when Howard Amundsen and Ed Carter and, and others, other citizens got together in collaboration with Los Angeles County to make a real great art museum for Los Angeles. At the occasion of the 50th anniversary, when you think about that, that landmark, what does that cause you to think about revisiting its past and where it is today? Well, we had an event recently where I started my talk with Ed Carter's opening words, which were all about how a museum has to keep changing. And I read them as if they could have, I couldn't have said it better myself. And there was a, an incredible founding spirit then. And, and you can feel the spirit of Los Angeles in the 60s. Uh, there were many difficult things going on. I mean, 1965 was a tough year. Uh, you think about the Watts riots, you think about a lot of things going on at that time in the 60s. Um, but the, the spirit of achievement, the bright future, I think was all packed into this new art museum. Um, you know, things change. Uh, Christopher Knight, the LA Times art critic, uh, art, art critic, wrote a story about the great space sculpture that was in front of LACMA, the pride of LACMA in 1965, and asked the question, where was it? And it was actually crowdsourced by social media that, in fact, quietly, it was not considered the coolest thing very soon after, and it is now in Germany and in, at the Delmer Benz uh, headquarters. There were a lot of fun stories around the anniversary. Um, uh, you may read the blog, uh, LA County Museum on Fire, and uh, th it's a really great blog, actually. And another question was asked about the most important painting at LACMA in 1965, as presented by the museum, which was a Goya. $270,000 spent on this Goya. And then again, it, within 10 years, it wasn't there. So Bill Poundstone asked the blog writer, where was it? In fact, I didn't know. I sent an email that morning to my staff. By 10 o'clock, we had the file. 
Indeed, soon after, it wasn't considered a Goya. Um, and then we gave the story to Bill Poundstone. A quarter of a million dollar forgery? R right. And that was a lot of money in those days. <laughs> it's a lot and of money it now. It was not considered a Goya. This happens in museums. And he traced it to the collection. I think it was traced to the collection. We helped to the collection of Emil de Marcos. And he found a great picture of the painting kind of on an angle behind a sofa with Imelda and her dogs. And, you know, that's no part shoes. of the history of art. <laughs> but what was great about it is, and I say this all seriousness, is the two-way communications with the audience in this social media world that's having fun with the 50th as well as celebrating very seriously this huge accomplishment for Los Angeles. And I think it is a new era of optimism about the future, and not just because of the museum and buildings, but of, of, of the way we communicate um, as we are tonight. When you came to the museum in 2006, what were your impressions of the museum's strengths and weaknesses? What were your concerns when you came on board? Well, strengths included location, location, location. Uh, not only on Wilshire Boulevard in, this, in a sort of center of, of the giant metropolis of Los Angeles, but you know, every, it's been the myth forever that Los Angeles is the city of the future. And the fact is, it is the city of the future. There are more artists working here today, I think, than any other city in the world. Uh, and I think that that sense of uh, the LA being an artistic capital is more palpable than ever. So that idea of being in Los Angeles drew me. Um, the collections are quite strong. We'll talk about that later. Stronger than people think, in part because they're housed in sort of not the best buildings. But the collection is fairly strong, needed to grow. And you know, the physical plant was probably the biggest challenge. We only had 600,000 people a year coming to the museum, which is small for mm -hmm. a big museum. And so we made it uh, the primary uh, goal to fix the facility, the park, the open space. And already that's resulted in doubling attendance, and you'll see in the future as we, um, as we continue to develop the museum how much more accessible the collection will become. So even though we're celebrating the 50th anniversary and the history of, of big museums and important museums, that's relatively young. So what are the challenges for an institution that is, by comparison, not that old? Yeah, we're, it's, we're baby years by museum <laughs> standards. I mean, the, the museums on the East Coast may have 100 plus years on us, 150 years. So that means the shape of our collection is very different. You couldn't buy European masterworks, Caravaggio's, things like that by the time 1965 rolls around. Not that we don't have masterpieces, but it affects the collection. In fact, we have a strong em emphasis on contemporary art, in part because LA by the 60s was already a, a, a big place for contemporary art. And so whether it's Ed Keenholz or Ed Ruscha or Robert Irwin, those artists were shown as part of this encyclopedic museum. Uh, and so there's a sense of youthfulness that is positive. Uh, people say, said when LACMA was started, I think on the East Coast, it's too late to build such a museum. All the masterpieces are gone. It didn't turn out to be the case. It gives the museum a different shape, and that shape is gonna become more and more important as the world keeps changing, as geopolitics shifts to Asia and Latin America, and on the Pacific Rim, Los Angeles becomes even more central to, to the world, and, and I think the shape of our collections can reflect that. It used to be, in museums, you had to have the biggest and the best by traditional standards of that Janssen history of art. Now we think differently that uh, in an age of airplane travel, photography, internet, what's really important is quality, but also the character of your collection. What does the museum express of, of us, our time, our civilization, our place on earth, and how we view things from Los Angeles? And so one of the strengths will become and is becoming the difference in character of the museum. And, and the idea is to stand out in that way. I think in 65, the idea was to be a version of what existed and started earlier on the East Coast. Now we're, we're in advance thinking about the demographics of the country, investing in Latin American art, for example, more than any other museum. Um, and, and it's really about shaping the program and the, 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 the worldview. How would you define the character of the museum? And, or is it where you want it to be, or is it a work in progress? It's always a work in progress. The word encyclopedic, is, I hate that word. The sense that you can have a totality, because the definition of encyclopedic in 1860 was very different than the definition in 1900, 1925, 1965, and now. 
in general, museums have become more inclusive. But it wasn't long ago that African art was included in the Metropolitan Museum. It wasn't included really in LACMA until three years ago. Mm. But um, th that idea of, of reshaping the encyclopedia in that sense and filling in gaps is a never ending and kind of futile effort. I like to think of what LACMA is, this big museum that spans from ancient times to the present in every media, not as encyclopedic, but more like anything goes. If it's a spoon, or it's a movie, or if it's painting or sculpture, we have all those things in our collection. And that's what makes it quite special, because it's agile. It includes design. It includes you know, design and decorative arts. It includes posters, photography, movies, um, all these things that make up our culture. And I think that idea of the expansive definition of culture, and especially a multicultural museum in a multicultural city, is what's so exciting for me. Speaking of expansive, let's talk about LACMA's campus and the current plans of reinventing and remaking the campus. We have a couple of slides, so let's look at the first of, I think, three slides here. That's our new logo for the year, LACMA 50. <laughs> um, much was made of the, <laughs> of the recent um, change in little edges of design from the um, more curvilinear shape looked at from the air, which, by the way, no one will see it from the air except coming into except LAX, flying except me flying over. But if you look at that curve on Wilshire Boulevard, the museum crosses Wilshire Boulevard, this is the Peter Zumtor proposal in evolution. Um, the new design will look exactly the same from Wilshire Boulevard. And it, it actually has the same concept as was proposed two years ago. I just want to say a few things, that the museum radically expanded between 2006 and 2008 with the addition of the Broad Contemporary Art Museum and the Resnick Pavilion. That's 100,000 square feet of space. We almost doubled the exhibition space with that huge expansion. We doubled our audience, we doubled our programs, the campus doubled, we, we added the public artworks, Chris Burden's Urban Light, Levitated Mass, Barbara Kruger's monumental piece in the elevator and Robert Irwin's palm trees. Um, the mission now is not expansion, its quality and accessibility and efficiency. The older buildings, the three older buildings built in 1965 plus the building built in the 80s um, com that comprise the biggest block of buildings are s badly in need of repair. In fact, in a few years they won't be operable. The estimates to um, fix them range anywhere from 280 to 350 million dollars without any cosmetic improvements. That's just code, seismic, and other things. And this was discussed by the trustees in 2001. It may, we change the way we visit museums all the time. Between 1965 and now, everything's changed in terms of we have families visiting, we have a more diverse visitorship, we have a different kind of visitorship. And so to, to, to spend all that money on an old model makes no sense. Uh, also, those buildings are very vertical, so the upper floors, whatever you put on the upper floors is is not visited as much. So the idea that the trustees agreed to in 2001 and again now is why not just start from scratch with the exception of um, the 80s pavilion for Japanese art designed by Bruce Goff because it is largely intact. Many people have said those Pereira buildings, they represent Los Angeles of the 60s. I don't disagree. Pereira was a great architect. There's a great building right across the street, a skyscraper that I have an office in. But the buildings aren't there. They've been mangled, beat up, the pools aren't there, the entrance is gone, the whole soul of them isn't there anymore. It's just the interiors, and the interiors were what people complained about in 65. So um, the, the logic is clear. Preserve the uh, Japanese pavilion, the Goff pavilion, uh, who worked with Frank Lloyd Wright, beautiful, crazy, wonderful building that architecture students come from all over the round, around the world to see. And then remove the inefficient buildings for one simple facility, still leaving you lots of pavilions, the BCAM, the Resnick, the Japanese pavilion, but one huge facility that could bring the collections together, make them much more accessible, and particularly um, have a more, have just much more accessibility to the museum and the park. When so is this looking to the west? Is that yeah? Right? So okay. so the key feature, and you, it's hard to see in these because new drawings will be forthcoming. But this is looking from the sort of from the east. You right. see the Japanese pavilion a little bit in the Tar Lake there. But the key features are the museum is largely transparent. When that 90-foot stone wall was built, the attendance really never changed after that. You couldn't see what was going on in the museum. People don't 
go into a museum if they don't know what's already inside. So the transparency of the museum is key to let people walk through the park and, and sense what's in the museum and also see people in the museum. I think that's a value of today, which is transparency, not fortress. So we trade fortress for transparency. The idea is also flexibility. The collection has changed dramatically since 65. We added 20, over 20,000 artworks in the last six years. And we added African art, oceanic tribal art, uh, graphic arts, things we didn't even have. So the need to reassemble the collection and reorganize it is always present. And in a way, this museum is designed not just for me and my curators, but for my successor, who may think, well, that guy really didn't know how to organize art history. We need to reorganize it in a different way. So the horizontal floor plate um, allows for that complete flexibility, as well as transparency, and it allows for a solar farm. So instead of this museum sucking energy like a factory, which is what museums do with their climate systems, this will have passive, passive climate systems, um, solar energy, and actually a lot of other energy features that we're looking at trying to make it a zero energy building, which would, been, which would be unheard of in, in the museum field, uh, with skylights. Um, and we plan for a lot of spaces that are right off the park that are more educational. You can just go in and try to and look at art of different kinds before you make the commitment to the grand sweep of art history. Before you arrived at LACMA, Rem Coolhouse had proposed a campus that I think it's, didn't happen because budgetary reasons? I yeah, there was the a bond was issue at that time, and the public did not vote for it. It required a two-thirds majority. Um, you know, maybe LA wasn't ready for it. And by the way, that was, they were going to the public for the money. This plan is, is, is largely private. LACMA's mm -hmm. raised over $325 million in the last decade of private money. Um, we're proposing to raise 475 of private money. So this plan does not lean on the public. There's a $125 million a contribution proposed by the county, which is the sort of anchor for the match, but it's a much smaller public component, uh, I think, in percentage. And so um, I think this will succeed. The trustees are very excited about it. One of the nice features is that um, the building, as you may know, the horizontal building goes over Wilshire Boulevard, which does a lot of amazing things. What happens to the food trucks? That's my, my, They're my there. concern. They're there. Food trucks. Stay. The, the food, food trucks, trucks are not stay. touched. Okay, good. They're part of the museum, as you know. It's many <laughs> cultures, it's part of the many food trucks. That's the whole idea. Exactly. <laughs> it's so the food trucks are museum. preserved. Okay, keep going. I'm sorry. I as long just as the worried food about that. They'll be in the museum <laughs> in the new plan, actually. It kind of looks like that. But um, one of the things it does, it lifts 100,000 square feet of the museum outside of the park and provides almost two acres of open park space uh, where you can walk. So from just a public perspective, it's very nice. The trustees agreed to take that space across the street and use it for the museum. So it's a very exciting proposition all around. The collections will be much more accessible. And I'll say one other thing is that everybody, went, in 2001, there was a great fear of this idea of closing LACMA for five years for construction with the new plan, and this was the idea behind the Resnick Pavilion in part, expand first when we're closed in the collection galleries, we'll have that collection in the other buildings, we'll have 100,000 square feet of exhibition space open, which is still the largest art museum in the Western United States. So the public will never lose LACMA, and in 2018, actually, the um, Academy Museum of Motion Pictures will open on the campus, so there's gonna be a lot to see. And when, if everything goes well, should it open? <laughs> Uh, well, there's a few things. We, there are a few things we have to do. We have an environmental impact review, and I have to raise about 475 million dollars. But other than that, and we're we're actually on our way to that. The idea was to have this project open and finished before the subway stop opens on Wilshire Boulevard at the museum in 2023, because that will be game changing wow. for the entire uh, region. I think to have that that Wilshire purple line, and then to have a stop right at the museum it makes it super accessible. Let's talk a little bit about art. Uh, That's my <laughs> favorite topic. And about Finally, your curatorial to staff. So let's talk about how, before you look at these slides, let's talk about how you curate shows and your curatorial staff. How big is it? What do they charge with? If certain people have certain areas of expertise. What do you look for in a curator? Um, well, LACMA has 
you know, there are probably 30 some people who work in the curatorial field as curators in some way. And again, we're small. The Metropolitan Museum has millions of objects, millions of square feet of galleries. I don't even know how many curators. So we're still small by those uh, measures, but we have fantastic experts. I mean, when you're in a curatorial meeting and the curator next to you is actually taking notes in Chinese, that's cool. Um, as he said, and he's not Chinese, and he said, well, it's faster to take notes that way. So the number of languages spoken, the decades and decades, hundreds of years probably of education that are in that group of people who understand, speak many languages, who understand the world at large. In fact, you know, I worked for a contemporary art museum before this, mostly contemporary. And, and it's hard because you have just a few Curators, in that case, we had one, but the world is so big now, and you have to actually speak so many languages to understand what's going on in contemporary art history as well as world art history. So you really need a breadth of expertise. We are lucky to have people who have been there for a very long time, over 30 years. Stephanie Barron, you may know, she has done, I think this is her fourth, we're opening in the fall, it's opening in Venice this week, her fourth exhibition about German modern art. She has actually written the history of German modern art and four exhibitions at LACMA. We have had um, exhibitions of every kind. I think we're the strongest programming museum right now in Latin American art. We have fantastic areas. We just hired <clears throat> to head our Ancient Americas effort the former director of the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. That's Diana Magaloni. So we, we are able to draw that level of expertise and we're holding on to some of the um, curators who have incredible institutional knowledge. So I learn something every day at LACMA, um, largely from that curatorial staff. And what are the exhibits coming up that you are most excited about? Well, actually, the summer is going to be... Uh, Really nice. So we have coming up an exhibition, a single person exhibition of Noah Purifoy, who you may know is a very important African American artist. He was he was very instrumental actually in Watts and at the Watts Towers. He's an artist you might talk about in terms of assemblage. He uh, spent his later years in the desert in Joshua Tree, and you can see his in beautiful installations there. He's never been given a retrospective, so this is the first of its kind, that is very special. And then for something completely different, following that will be a retrospective of Frank Gehry's architecture, another LA favorite. <laughs> so I will say that I, if you've noticed the programming, whether it's that or Ken Price or California Design or James Terrell or Ed Moses coming up in the fall, um, Diana Thader coming up in the fall, another LA artist, we've really privileged in the last decade Los Angeles art history with the PST programs that were funded by the Getty in that series of exhibitions four years ago, three years ago, um, there's a growing recognition that Los Angeles has an art history, and it's pretty great. And so since LACMA was there in 65 charting it, we've, we've put in a huge amount of effort to uh, being that document, both in the works we collect and the exhibitions we make, and we see it as our obligation to send those shows around the world. So California design, which wasn't a category before Wendy Kaplan's show, is now traveling Asia to huge success. Uh, Ken Price went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, as did John Baldessari's retrospective. Mm -hmm. So we're putting major LA artists that wouldn't have otherwise had that chance. The James Terrell show was national. Um, that's exciting to have the point of view and that art history written by curators here and then sent around the world. How much time or energy do you put into worrying about new ways of showing art and displaying it and making sure it's not all behind a piece of glass or a rope barrier? Well, I think that I always say there are two things about the museum itself other than the most important thing, which is the audience, which is the, the art, and which is made by artists, and then how it's shown, right? How it's shown is key. And that has changed over many years. Um, remember, museums have been around, if they've been around for 250 years, that's a blink of time compared to the 35,000 years or more of art history. So the idea of display is a new concept. It's continually changing. It will continue to change. And part of what we're interested in in Los Angeles, since we are a place of design, um, is 
pushing the envelope a little. I don't know how many people here in the audience saw Frank Gehry's design for either the Ken Price show or for the Alexander Calder show. Mm -hmm. um, right now you can see a design for German Expressionist film done by a Amy Murphy and Michael Maltzen, two local architects. Uh, we, uh, Kulapat Janterzeis, who you may know, uh, designed the Samurai show. Mm -hmm. So we've actually been putting local architects, brilliant ones, young ones like Frank Gehry and others, <laughs> to work creating environments that no one's seen before. And this has been, I think people have really taken to this investment in architecture and design as reframing. We've also invited artists, very controversial but experimental was the redesign of the ancient American galleries by Jorge Pardo, Cuban born artist who was mostly in California, went to Art Center and now living in Mexico. And he, re he there was a slide recently of those, of those galleries that are completely different, but everybody says, well, it's not what I expect of a white room or a gray room with boxes, but none of those works were made for museums. They were made for the netherworld, for, for, for transformation. A lot of them were underground. So in some ways, you know, trying, inviting an artist like Jorge to, to try to create a new truth, a framing that might be in dialogue with those artists, which he can feel alive as an artist, and do something new, some may fail, some may succeed, but I think it's an important thing to keep thinking about display and what we can do. I mean, another important thing for me is just the outdoors. Um, mm -hmm. Chris Burden's Urban Light is our architecture. My dream was, in the guidebook, instead of having a building, couldn't you have a work of art as <laughs> the entrance to the museum? Wouldn't that be truer to our mission? And so Urban Light, Levitated Mass, the, those, those environmental artworks, flipping the museum to have more of the museum outside makes sense in California. Um, it provides a more casual environment for people to feel they're in the museum before they're in the museum. So all those questions about display are continuing to evolve, and I, I think we're doing a good job with all the curators and designers to thinking about that in new ways and actually becoming leaders in, in that that question of museum display. I have a question about the permanent collection and about how much money is allocated every year to growing that collection. If there are certain things, and I guess you could, maybe you don't want to say what's on your wish list because it'll drive up the price by 20%, but what are the kinds of things you're after and how does that acquisitions budget work? It's easy. We don't have one. <laughs> um, we start the year with zero. And we're one of the only large museums in that case. That comes with youth, because a lot of the acquisitions, endowments, or budgets that were established for museums, Cleveland has many, many millions every year, were established at the turn of the century earlier. They were invested, and now they're really worth something, whereas um, Lackman has not yet established that regular acquisitions uh, budget. Every work of art that comes into LACMA is a private donation either a donation of artwork or um, a donation of money to acquire an artwork. Now, it's pretty hard because you're always trying to talk people into supporting that museum, but there's something that's great about the honesty of the back and forth and needing to convince people uh, rather than just having a chance to do it top down. So every work of art and acquisition, usually as a curator, a donor, uh, an artist, if there's an artist alive, and I don't know, it, it's, it, it's harder one, but that much more meaningful when you acquire something uh, that way by raising the funds to do it. Well, you should talk about the big gift you got not that long ago and what that meant to your collection. Yeah, so recently has been in the news that it's hard for me to describe, you know, buildings and money always get the attention in the media, but it's really about art. And the building's just a frame. A lot of people wouldn't put their collections in the existing facilities, for example. And one of those was Mr. Parencio, who had one of the very best collections in the United States, not just in Los Angeles, including Impressionist masterpieces. You've seen the pictures, Degas, Monet, uh, Bonard, amazing things. And when we came forward with the idea of a building program, he said, well, if Lachman's gonna be serious about that, maybe I'll leave my collection here. And as you know, that resulted in the single largest promise of art to LACMA by far, by five times by more um, in our history. And the theme of the 50th anniversary for me, again, to try to communicate to the public that it's, you know, you can rebuild buildings, they're frames, they're, they're 
they create accessibility. They have to be efficient, but it's about the art. And so this 50th anniversary has been about gifts of art. And, and we not only have spent a lot of time in gratitude to donors, like the Amundsen's or the Carters on the screen here, are two incredible works of art. Uh, one by George Delatour, a very rare, rare work that is, I mean, priceless of the Magdalene, which is one of many acquisitions made by the Amundsen family and foundation over those 50 years, who have helped build a very significant European, mostly painting, but also sculpture collection. And, you know, this is one of the best paintings in the United States of European art. It's not just Los Angeles or LACMA. It's a beautiful meditative picture and just tip of the iceberg of the Amundsen's generosity over those years. On the right is just one example of our Dutch painting collection that Ed Carter, the other major founder of LACMA 50 years ago, systematically assembled for the public of Los Angeles in conjunction with LACMA. So these now, you can go to the galleries and see these every day. Um, those are linchpins of the existing collections. And of course, there is more to come. So this 50th anniversary celebration, uh, I don't know how to count it because there were groups of work. We had more than 50 works gifted. Um, the total value is maybe not as much as the Prencho collection, but it's close. It's very large. And, and the masterpieces that were included, I don't know if we have. Yeah, I scroll through it. I think we got slides, some more but, slides. But let me just talk about, I, yeah. if it's okay, yeah, and describe some artworks. Um, I was so excited about the article the LA Times did about the unsung women heroes of LACMA. Uh, this beautiful um, Assyrian relief, these reliefs that are in LACMA are rare anywhere. And of course, you know what's going on in the Middle East. It's rare and very good that a lot of these things are in the United States and protected given what's going on right now in the world. This was a purchase by Anna Bing Arnold who was an angel for the museum. These were expensive when they were acquired. This was a big reach for LACMA. And, and now there's just no, they're priceless, they're incredible, and they sit as the cornerstone um, as you walk from sort of some of the Egyptian galleries and into Europe. Uh, the uh, Mia Chandler Frost, who was a Chandler, and she was on, uh, has been on LACMA's board, I think she's was on Lackman's board since before I was born, and the museum was founded on uh, Wilshire Boulevard. She's made many acquisitions, among them a significant group of, uh, of Islamic artworks that puts our collection at the very top levels. In fact, our Islamic collection is so strong that it's going to Saudi Arabia, because those works don't exist there, to open a new museum uh, mm -hmm. there this year. And we're acquiring more and more works. We, we acquired an incredibly rare Damascus room um, as well. This is just on the right one of the many acquisitions that were made also with Mia's generosity in probably the area of art she loved the most, which was pre-Columbian or ancient American art. She just could not get enough of it. This is, a, this is Colombian, but our ancient American collections are among the best anywhere. And while you can go to Mexico to the museums to see those Mayan and Olmec works and those around Mexico, you can go to LACMA and you can see Peruvian textiles, Colombian, Panamanian. Um, it's an amazing collection of Latin American art and Mia was key to that. Vast changes have been made in the collection just recently. Um, Janice and Henri Lazaroff decided that their collection built in Los Angeles over many years, their collection of modern art, should stay in Los Angeles. And so an agreement was worked out, which is mostly a gift, largely a gift. It's one of the greatest modern art gifts in the United States. You've probably seen this group of Giacometti's, um, which is one. There are also, I think, 27 Picassos. But <laughs> th that collection has dramatically reshaped the modern galleries and what you can see in California, again, because nothing like this has, is in a public museum in California. Um, but the range of media, photography, if you think of us as a media town, photography is so key, and photography wasn't collected by museums as art. It was as archive for such a long time. Uh, on the right, uh, image in Cunningham, a famous, famous image, and this was part of the Marjorie and Leonard Vernon collection, another collection established with a modest amount of money in Los Angeles in photography before it was really expensive that the family wanted to stay in LA, um, and it was worked out that the Annenberg Foundation and Wallace Annenberg made it possible for a gift purchase and that collection of thousands of photographs puts us on the map, which then drew the attention 
of the Robert Maplethorpe Foundation, who left the entire uh, estate, remaining estate of Robert Maplethorpe in a joint gift to the Getty and LACMA. So we are now photography city with the Getty's resources, LACMA's resources. You want to study photography, you come to Los Angeles. Um, and of course, there are the public artworks. You know, you can spend hundreds, tens of millions on masterpieces, or you can take a risk and try to make one. Um, <laughs> And that's a little bit of what we tried to do in some of the public artworks working again with artists in Los Angeles like Chris Burden. Well, I think we have, there's, yeah. Yes. Levitated mass. Yes. That, and, then uh, what happens to Chris Burden's piece in the remodel? Doesn't move. And Nothing moves. Nothing moves. Levitated mass, move. they all survive. <laughs> Try to move <laughs> levitated <laughs> mass. It was people were joking around that. whether we would loan it to any other <laughs> exhibitions. And I think the answer is... If you can Try, move it. If you can move it. <laughs> we talked a lot about art. We've talked about the campus. I want to talk about audience. Uh, historically, in the museum world, if you look at the representation of who does and does not go to museums, especially among Hispanic and African-American audiences, they tend not to turn up in the same amounts that they constitute the population. So is that true at LACMA as well? And what kinds of things are you trying to do to make sure that your audience is as diverse as the city itself? Yeah, that is our goal, to make the collections as diverse as they can be and, and reach out to that audience. Now, not every culture has museum going as part of growing up. So you have to see that as a, maybe a many-generation effort. You're not going to turn on a switch and have everybody change their lifestyles. Um, everywhere of every diverse background. So it's a slow and methodical process. We have been pushing very hard to diversify audiences. We've increased audiences, and along with that increase, I mean, the Latino audience has al also doubled in percentage, and then that's an even larger doubling because the whole number has gone up. The Asian audiences are increasing, as they should in Los Angeles. Part of it is programming. We have probably the most active programming in Korean art, for example, and there are hundreds of thousands of Koreans a stone's throw from LACMA. Um, we are the most active, I think, today in acquisitions and programming in Latin American art. But I want to say this. You don't program Korean and Latin American art because you assume Koreans and Latin Americans only want to see that art. That, mm -hmm. that would be insane. You, they, they want to see every kind of art, like I think we all do. That's, everyone does. It's a, it's a community and, a, and an interest in art. But you have to create a sense of, of, um, of identity and comfort within the museum. If we don't show a lot of Latin American art, why go to LACMA if there's no identity built in for that culture and that thinking? And there are so many cultures. So the, the great pleasure of LACMA is that it doesn't matter where you come from, what your identity is, you can probably find something connected to you personally and your cultural identity at LACMA. So we're trying to promote LACMA as that kind of place more and more rather than a place where you see King Tut one show. Just come to LACMA, all of these cultures, everything all, you know, of time and place are there for you to explore. And it's working, We're, it, 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 and, and it will change generation by generation. Tearing down the walls, creating glass walls where you can walk through a park and sort of look in first. We do a lot of programming in music, um, whether it's jazz on Friday night or Latin sounds on the weekend that brings very diverse audiences, and they go to the museum. So. Um, it's, it's uh, what we're doing now, I think, is a lot more research. And we had a meeting yesterday about this with a grant from the Irvine Foundation. And thinking less about, well, this is what we think is great, and we're going to put it out there and advertise around it, to doing real research about what kinds of programs meet the needs of people of diverse people from diverse places, and to think more seriously about that, even reaching out location-wise. One of my favorite little projects of LACMA is that we run now the, um, we've working in collaboration with Charles White Elementary School to do exhibitions in their art gallery on MacArthur Park. And we're seeking a grant from the county now to open it to the park so it's not just for the kids in school, but there are kids now that have had five years 
of working with artists in LACMA's collections as elementary school kids. Well, you, you anticipated my next question, which is younger audiences. I think parents who are museum goers know that the best deal at LACMA is to sign up for Next Gen <laughs> and come in with your kids for free. <laughs> so talk about the Next Gen program and what that's done and how important that is in audience development for the next generation. Yeah, the Next Gen program is fantastic. If you have any kid under 17 can join for free and then bring a parent for free. And I do have parents who tell me that their kids want to come to LACMA too often um, to see Metropolis right. or Urban Light. Or, or, so it, it is very, it's been a great program to bring kids and families to LACMA. That does work. So that's part of the audience growth. And we are thinking about the next generations and everything we do. That is key. We have probably the largest museum in school art education program anywhere. Anna Bing Arnold left a $30 million endowment to support in-school education. So that is a huge program, um, very avant-garde, very much in the forefront of uh, museum education. Some museums have gone to a free or voluntary contribution admission model. Has LACMA considered that? What is its What are the strengths and pitfalls of doing that? Yeah, so everybody says, well, couldn't you make LACMA free? You could, but um, you would vastly curtail the number of exhibitions. In fact, you might not be able to have exhibitions at the costs we have them because the numbers don't work out, but that's a consideration. We, I don't think that's the best plan because, for example, Los Angeles County supports LACMA. There are a lot of tourists who come to Los Angeles who've spent a lot on airfare and restaurants and food and other things. They should pay for the museum because we are offering an amazing service in the public of Los Angeles. It's worth charging admission. If you want to go to LACMA for free, it's very easy to go for free. We have Target free Mondays. We have many weekend free days. We have the Next Gen program. Just find a kid. Uh, <laughs> you know, membership is really cheap. Uh, the, you know, there's so many ways to go to LACMA for free. And almost what people don't get is almost half the people go to LACMA for free. So it's not hard if that's the issue. You want to get there, you can get there for free. What's really great, though, about admission charges of some kind, even if they're discounted, even if they're free for county residents after three, even if there's next gen, a lot of free given away, is one, public are patrons. Like they are supporting the museum when they they do that, and in tough times, and this is a very specific example, the most sustainable museums have diverse sources of income. Because in times like when the economy crashed in 2008, it was impossible to get money from corporations or a lot of individuals who were feeling the pinch. But Los Angeles County was steady, and the public increased their visits and their support for LACMA. So LACMA kept running in a balanced budget because the public was buoying us. And they felt that energy, I think. So the key is diverse revenue sources for sustainability, a lot of opportunity to go for free. So a lot of your audience is coming for free and not giving away the store so that, you know, people who are paying to go to Los Angeles and paid other things, they're contributing to the museum. I want to end by asking you about wishes and dreams, wishes being things that are <laughs> realistic and maybe achievable dreams being a little more pie in the sky. So what's on your wish list? Well, I wish for some things that we got. Here's a few pictures. <laughs> the Degas from the Parentio <laughs> collection or Keys Van Dongen. You just wish things into existence, right? On the left is the Amundsen Foundation's latest gift, which is a Gian Lorenzo Bernini sculpture. I didn't even know you could buy a Bernini. <laughs> Dominique Ang's Madonna, which was one of four major gifts from the Resnick family. These are, that's a promised gift. Or on the right, Andy Warhol's Maryland, 1962. Even with the largest acquisition budget in the country, you couldn't buy that work. So that's the generosity. These are wishes. I wished for these, asked for them, they came. Uh, how about this, which is hanging in LACMA right now? Um, that is an incredibly beautiful gift, of a, a promised gift of Wendy and Leonard Goldberg. You can't ask for a more beautiful scene in the country. Madame Monet, pink sunflakes of light. Uh, this was in a day in the country 30 years ago at LACMA and is now, will someday be back. Um, D. Wayne Valentine, one of the great Los Angeles artists, his major work, or what I think is one of the most important paintings ever made in Los Angeles, Via Selman's TV 
from 1964 that one of our trustees, Steve Tisch, promised. Uh, she's an incredible artist. Or Roy Lichtenstein, um, which was also a Nathanson gift from the Nath Mark and Jane Nathanson family. This serpent, this Baga people serpent, is one of the most incredible works of African art I've ever seen. Um, it was in Matisse's studio, Henri Matisse's studio. That says something. And it will someday be permanently at LACMA, gift of Bobby Kotick. Or, as you can see, the very present, Stephen Roth, one of our trustees, uh, made a gift of a Marc Grosjean, made in L.A., two years ago. So you wish for things, and often they come true. And your dream is that you get a good EIR, that you pass your environmental <laughs> impact well, report? Well, yeah, I can put out a plea that, <laughs> here's the thing, that public projects are hard. Everybody has an opinion. Um, but if we can collect the energy right now and the generosity, we could be on this schedule if people are, and, and this is a good plan. We're not adding a square foot. We're actually taking LACMA out of the park, opening up the park. There's nothing bad about the new plan, assuming it's paid for. Um, we need everybody behind it, and I would like it to go very smoothly so that we can be open with the subway, because I think for Los Angeles, that will be a very great day. Before we go to audience questions, I want to thank the staff of The Frame, our producers, Oscar Garza. You should stand up, Oscar. Darby Maloney, <laughs> Michelle Lands, James Kim, Cameron Kell are in the back. John Cohn for putting on this event. I want to thank Michael Govan for showing up. Thank you, John. And we have a couple minutes for audience questions. So who has an audience question? Wait for a microphone. Make them short so we can get to a couple, and then we'll send you off into the night. So go ahead. so I hope there's some sort of uh, audience for uh, film in the new facility. And also, does the square footage change uh, for the buildings that are taken away relative to what's being built newly by 2023? Uh, thanks for asking the question about film. As you probably know, we struggled with film. There wasn't a nickel of philanthropy for film at LACMA uh, six or seven years ago. Surprising. It was the only program we didn't have philanthropy for. That's changed. Not only do we have an active program curated by Elvis Mitchell and in, in conjunction with Film Independent, um, but you know that led to the collaboration with the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and the idea of finally in Los Angeles establishing a museum of movies. So there will be, an, we're not, just because there's a museum of movies, that doesn't mean we are not going to show films. We will have a theater in the new building. It's actually going to be pretty spectacular. Um, you're gonna see, sometimes you can see movies from the street from it. It's very innovative. <laughs> and uh, we won't stop making exhibitions related to film, especially where they overlap with art, like German Expressionist Cinema, which has objects from our own collection with it. So film is very strong. On the square footage question, we just expanded by 100,000 square feet. That's a big stretch financially, operationally, that almost doubled us. So. You, you can't endlessly grow on budgets. You'll be spending way too much money on operations and not enough on art and art programs. So the design for the new building is about efficiency. It will be the same square footage envelope, or a little bit more, but it will have 45,000 square feet, which is a Resnick pavilion, more exhibition space, and the exhibition space is laid out such that um, it's much more efficient. You'll probably be able to see five times the number of artworks in the same space. So it's really a campaign of quality and efficiency. A uh, question, I think, in the back. Yep, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Joseph. I, uh, I live in West Hollywood. Uh, the first time I went to LACMA, I was like six, and I saw a Diego Rivera show. And awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is, Christopher Hawthorne mentioned in his latest piece that kind of looked back at the history of LACMA that one of the falters of the old buildings was that it was very buttoned up and did not reflect Los Angeles at the time. So my question to you is, how do you see the ink blob, as it's being called, reflect Los Angeles today? Um, that's a good question. How does the building reflect Los Angeles today? And that is something we've been talking about a lot. One thing is there's no one Los Angeles. So there are many things about Los Angeles. One of the things about the building is not the design of the building, but the design of the art programs. So there's a very specific thing about how the horizontal building not only reflects the horizontality of Los Angeles, 
But the fact that if you can put many cultures on one floor, rather than creating a hierarchy of who's first and who's last and who's up and who's down, that you reflect the spirit of this great metropolis, which is multicultural on a flat plane that can be rearranged and where things can be juxtaposed in interesting ways. So that horizontality for me is the key both to the flexibility of the program and to expressing art history like Los Angeles, non-hierarchical, uh, rearrangeable, and in a horizontal attitude, which goes with the park, and also provides this field. It's ba basically a solar farm, so we can soak up that sun. It used to be oil right there that they <laughs> would is. they would um, uh, drill for right, right at Hancock Park, place. and now we're going to be mining the sun. So I think just those two things, in addition to the indoor-outdoor quality, the transparency, which we've redesigned the whole museum around indoors and outdoors to reflect that, that as well as the casualness. I mean, my New York friend said, "You really, you put the bar and the restaurant at the entrance? Doesn't that seem a little, you know, sacrilegious?" I was like, "No, that's the casualness of Los Angeles. That's the town square. Um, it, so the gardens and the indoor-outdoor. I think all those things are very." thoughtfully considered in terms of reflections of Los Angeles. What something looks like. Everything looks like something in Los Angeles. It's all different. I don't think you can pin the look. It's more these, the arrangement of space and these ideas and the sun and the transparency and the indoors and outdoors and the non-hierarchical qualities that reflect Los Angeles very deeply. Great. Over here. On the, yep. Hi. Um, I'm Gabe. I'm from Silver Lake also. Um, I just wanted to say firstly thank you for coming and talking, both of you, and um, that I'm, I'm a college student and I think, although I understand an entire museum being free for everyone is, or impossible for LACMA right now, that potentially having it free for students, for college students would be really important and special for me and my fellow students of Los Angeles. Um, and my question is in relation to your public programming and you've recently had really important uh, contemporary performances happening. You had Coco Fusco there, this I think this past year, and My Barbarian this past week, and these are people of color that are performing in your spaces, and I just feel that the outreach for those programs has been really minimal, and I'm just wondering about the future of public programming at LACMA with the redesign of the buildings, and uh, you know plans for other programming, and. Just in so general. Just to understand, the programming is good, but the outreach for them, meaning the yeah, word I think, out? I think those, those, yeah, the programming is really fantastic, but the, the outreach has been strange, and how, and how the redesign of the building might influence the changes in, in the programming. Uh, well, the, um, I mean, we try, you know, we are using social media because we don't want to spend a lot of money on advertising. We are uh, trying to put as many performances in public, uh, so we do do a lot of social media outreach. We are bringing those performances in the galleries. You're going to see with LALA, LA, Los Angeles Latin America, quite a few things that are both indoors and outdoors that are performative in the galleries, out of the galleries in that way. Uh, there'll be a lot of advertising and interest, I think, around that to make them more accessible. The new building actually has a lot of opportunities because of the way it's structured with a covered space that's outdoors. So there are many natural performance spaces, amphitheaters, and of course the gallery will have a lot of open space. Um, so you couldn't ask for more opportunities, I think, for a performance in the three buildings. There have been performances in the Japanese pavilion as well. Stephen Prina was playing music there not long ago. So um, I think we actually have a wonderful playground. And the trend in admission is more and more free. So I, I think you're going to see that continue um, in a steady evolution. I think there's a question here. Maybe we can get one more after this. Hi, I'm Dan Gellert. I'm, I'm in Larchmont. And my question is about technology. How is technology evolving for a museum, for LACMA and just museums in general of that size? You know, websites, apps, yeah. and all that. Yeah. Uh, so it's a good question about technology because technology is changing the entire world. <coughs> um, we have, I think we have been on the forefront of ideas. Uh, when I first got to LACMA, we, st we created a free reading room, digital reading room, where old publications like the Art and Technology Catalog are now available for free. Uh, you can just download them anywhere in the world. 
We've been aggressive in social media, tweeting in Spanish and English, uh, writing blogs. I think we've been ahead of the curve in trying to use social media as a two-way communications tool. Um, we're also uh, publishing scholarly catalogs because scholarly catalogs can be updated. That's great for the web but they also need to be footnoted as historical documents. So working with the Getty, we've done that. So I think we're doing a lot. Our budgets are small, um, but I think one of the, and, and you'll see lots of changes, like this new building is gonna be designed for advances in technology. We already have beacons where if you're with an iPhone or something like that or a mobile phone where information will pop up about where you are. You can imagine that in the future that you wouldn't have to have a label in one language. You can have music if you want it, that, is from the time or sub supplementary information. We're thinking that, and by removing some of that text and information from the walls, it can also enhance your visceral experience, not biasing it with one language or a way of mm -hmm. writing about something. Um, but the thing I'm most excited about is the rekindling of the art and technology program that Maurice Tuckman, curator, and others started in the late 60s at LACMA. The book is online. It was one of the most famous projects. It was called Art and Technology Project. That was the heyday. We were putting a man on the moon, aerospace, everything, plastics, new technologies. And the idea was to pair artists and corporations or scientists and artists. It, it was apparently, I wasn't there, not the greatest exhibition. <laughs> but the catalog, which is full of failures as well as, as well as successes, is one of the great documents of experimentation in museums. And so we've just rekindled that program. And we used a county productivity grant to turn our library into a library and art and technology lab very casual, green sofa, screens. You can come hear talks from somebody who's writing poetry in code at Google or an artist who's making baking pies, which give you statistics about why there aren't, what, how, how few women are shown in art museums. Um, and that's all printed out by data and 3D printers. Uh, and we've rekindled this laboratory. We have a lot of companies that are supporting us. And the largest was an announcement we made recently, the Hyundai Corporation, Korean company, car company, is gonna fund that project through 2020. And that includes grants to artists, like the old days, to work with um, scientists and corporations to come up with new ideas. And we may be even launching a satellite. So <laughs> I, I think there is, there's a lot you're going to see come out of that. And, and, and it's nice because in its 50-year history, that's almost 50-year-old, LACMA owns that, that idea. And you're going to see it rekindled in a beautiful way now and in the future. Let's try to get two more questions. I see your hand up. Let's go here, and then we'll go there, and we'll call it a night. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Amelia from Pasadena. And as you uh, were discussing the revamping of the experience of visiting a, a museum, I'm thinking about young children. When you take them there and say, you can't touch, don't run, mm -hmm. the guards are looking at you, don't yell, and <laughs> usually the discovery room is in the basement somewhere. Is that being thought and incorporated into this new museum that as you walk as a family or as a school group, right. um, that the kids can experience it the way kids tend right. to experience it? Don't life. treat them like kids, treat them like <laughs> visitors. Um, yes, I mean, I believe strongly in that. Um, you, you know, urban light you can touch. That's one of the beauties of it. People hug and kiss it. <laughs> so much so that we have to restore it already because <laughs> it's been worn down from the love. Uh, so there is a lot you can touch. Um, you know, why you can't touch is that you're trying to preserve things for others. So there's also a learning there about sharing and about how I mean, it's like the environmental movement. Everything, we take resources. It's the same as when you take a long shower or, or take something away from others. So I think there are, we try to be gentle about it. We try to have areas where you can touch. I think we're gonna try to have more and more of that in the future as we have space. I really hate that if the kid's space is in the basement. So you, you, right now, the, the space where kids are drawing, which my daughter loves to go to, is it's actually in the Korean art galleries and it's thematized to ink painting, uh, which with a beautiful drawing on the, on the, on the wall and, a, and windows out to the park. So we have put it right in the middle of the room rather than back in a corner. Um, you don't want kids to run because they're gonna hurt themselves and maybe somebody else. <laughs> so we do discourage running, and I've seen not just scraped knees, but 
other things. So, you know, you're always trying to have a balance. Uh, one of the things is to try to get parents and guardians into the idea of using it as an experience of teaching uh, and, and sort of, and, and it's interesting, I find kids quickly adapt as they go to the museum a few times. Maybe the first time it's don't touch and they don't know, but if they come back, and as I said, parents do complain, the kids want to go back and be in the yellow spaghetti or, you know, be at Urban Light or see Metropolis and all the cars, um, a little bit more viewing we find quickly kids do adapt and, you know, my 10-year-old likes to give tours of the museum to other kids. So. <laughs> It, 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 it's an effort, and there's always a balance. And I think, did you have your hand up? Last, uh, last question right here, go ahead. Hi, I'm Teresa from LA. Um, my question is about the relationship between art and artists. Mm -hmm. um, I recently read, and I can't recall where I read it, so I apologize for that, uh, that the general public appreciates and values art but does not necessarily have the same appreciation for the artist. Uh -huh. And I wondered what your thoughts were about how the, what the museum's role is in perhaps bridging that gap. And it sounds like some of the programs you have and are mm -hmm. planning on having work in that direction, but I just wondered what your thoughts yeah. were in general about that. That's a good question. Thank you for all your questions. <laughs> I think they're really on point. Uh, and I'm a person who spent, I've spent my life working with artists and, and most of the, even the exhibitions that I've made have all been with living artists because it's a very magical experience to be collaborating with a living artist. And so a lot of what I did when I first got to LACMA was try to put artists in the forefront. Um, John Baldessari designed our logo. Uh, he designed uh, an exhibition, Jorge Pardo, Franz Vest, Barbara Kruger is the first thing you read when you go into BCAM. Bob Irwin developed the Palm Gardens, and we've tried to uh, have those artists present, honor them. And part of that and putting contemporary art up front, people have said, oh, you're the t contemporary art guy. You just, you're all about contemporary art. My thing is, every piece of art was made by someone at some time and was contemporary art, <laughs> as far as I know. And so it's really important to understand the artist component and part of the way to give life to the objects where you no longer have the artists is to have the artists engaged in that program and have them very upfront in the museum. And I wish we would actually just get rid of the distinction contemporary art as a category and just say, you know, the museum has art that was made by artists and that is what we're looking at at any time and not to say that you know, an artist is not attached to a work of art history or of another time. So I, I do believe we've tried to foreground artists. Uh, you, you can't do it enough. I do conversations with artists. Um, but that's the great thing about being in LA. And you don't go to, LAC, you go to LACMA any day, and you're also going to meet a lot of artists. So um, we do try very hard to do that. And I think of the big, stodgy museums we are, um, I think we do a good job at that. Michael Govan, thank you for celebrating the 50th anniversary of LACMA with us. Thanks, John. And I think we are all very excited about what the next 50 years hold. So thank you very much, thank Michael Govan, Director and Chief Executive Officer of LACMA. Thank you for your time. And thank You're you welcome. all for coming out thank and for you your all. great questions. Thanks, thanks thank very you. much. Have a good listening. night.